All right. So this is the final video for the series of conversations about diseases affecting the respiratory system. So next up is tuberculosis, which is caused by the bacteria, Mycobacterium tuberculosis. And so you'll notice on this slide, I was feeling a little sassy. And so I might say, why are you know, you tell me the pathogenicity because you should already know because we've talked about it a lot in the lab. Um, and we talked about this genus when we talked about leprosy. So remember, it all comes back to mycobacterium and the presence of mycolic acid in the cell wall, which causes it to be a slow grower. Um, it just makes it really hard to stain and diagnose and even treat. Um, so just a lot of review on mycobacterium as a genus. So when it comes to tuberculosis, uh, people are actually easily infected, but tend to be more resistant to the disease. Only about um, five, to, five to 10% of people actually develop a clinical case of tuberculosis. Um, oftentimes it's contained in the lungs, but disseminated a bacteria can give rise to tuberculosis in actually in any organ um, of the body. So clinical tuberculosis is divided into three categories, primary, secondary, and disseminated tuberculosis. So primary tuberculosis, and that really occurs when um, a minimum number of cells are needed to cause an infection, uh, which is about 10 actually. And so alveolar macrophages are going to phagocytose those cells, but the bacteria don't die. Rather, they multiply. So um, about three to four weeks post-infection, a very strong immune response is, is going to occur. And the influx of um, mononuclear cells into the lungs is going to contribute to the formation of specific infection sites called tubercles which are granulomas that consist of central core containing bacteria in enlarged macrophages, along with an outer wall made of fibroblasts, lymphocytes, macrophages. Um, the center of those tubercles are going to contain a soft white material uh, known as caseous necrosis. And although this typically prevents the spread of infections, uh, neutrophils are going to release enzymes, um, the centers of the tubercles are going to break down into necrotic caseous lesions that are actually going to heal uh, by calcification. And um, so that's going to basically cause normal lung tissue to be replaced by calcium deposits. So there's a lot of detail uh, in that little spiel. Um, I'm not going to get super detailed with it, but just understand, you know, um, how the lung tissue is replaced by calcium deposits, you know, and what tubercles are and things like that. Now, secondary tuberculosis. So most treated patients are going to recover completely from that primary infection. But um, it is possible for live bacteria to remain dormant and become reactivated weeks, months later, uh, years later. Um, in life. And so with chronic tuberculosis, um, the tubercles are filled with masses of bacteria and they're going to expand and cause cavities in the lungs and drain into the bronchial tubes and the upper respiratory tract. So this is going to be when more severe symptoms start to show up, like violent coughing, a greenish or bloody uh, sputum, anorexia, um, what else? Uh, extreme fatigue, weight loss, night sweats. Um, chest pains. And again, if it's still left untreated, it does have a 60% um, fatality rate, um, which is pretty high. Um, so it is something that, of course, should be, um, if you ever suspect you have a patient or a, a, you have tuberculosis or a patient has it, it really does need to be um, to be treated pretty quickly. So um, just a little, little thing worth noting here, the Lubeck disaster of 1926. Um, it's, it was a pretty, pretty uh, big disaster, a unique event um, in history. And what ended up happening 
was over 250 newborns were unintentionally, accidentally um, infected with a virulent strain of mycobacterium tuberculosis. And this happened when um, the BCG vaccine was first like introduced um, as like an anti-tuberculosis vaccine. And it actually was a result of um, an accidental contamination of the vaccine, like the, the preparations for the vaccine with virulent mycobacterium tuberculosis. So it wasn't because of the actual vaccine itself. It was just some doses had been contaminated um, and it was given um, to, to infants. So uh, pretty, pretty scary, right? Things unfortunately like this do happen. Um, nowadays, we have much more serious and lengthy screening processes. We do things a little bit different now. This is back in 1926. So we've learned a lot in almost these hundred years. Um, but, you know, things unfortunately do still um, happen. All right, next up, um, the last thing we're gonna talk about is pneumonia. But we're gonna break this into bacterial pneumonia and then nosocomial pneumonia. So when it comes to pneumonia, most of them are caused by bacteria, hence the title of this slide. And so more often than not, um, it is the causative agent is going to be streptococcus pneumoniae. So we refer to this um, as pneumococcal pneumonia. And um, we've talked about this bacteria when we talked about like meningitis um, and also when we talked about earaches earlier on. Um, and it can be associated with sepsis as well. So this is an ovoid bacterium. So if you look at that picture, um, they tend to look more like little ovals there. And their main form of pathogenicity is going to be having a capsule. So it's not uh, super characteristic, um, but if somebody gets infected with it, right, it can have some pretty serious um, consequences. So with pneumonia, you're gonna see breathing difficulties, pain in the chest. Um, you do tend to see um, rust-colored sputum, and a lot of times the lungs are red. And so this is one of the organisms that we can do the optotion test for. Remember Kirby Bauer test, um, it is, um, susceptible to optotion. So if you were to make a lawn of this bacteria and put an optotion disc in the middle, you should see a nice clear zone of inhibition. Um, another form of bacterial pneumonia is caused by mycoplasma pneumoniae. So we refer to this as mycoplasmal pneumonia. And mycoplasma as a genus are really unique because it's the genus of bacteria that does not have a cell wall. So they grow pretty slow compared to most bacteria, uh, not quite mycobacterium snail rates, uh, but slower nonetheless. And the symptoms associated with mycoplasmal uh, pneumonia um, are going to last for about three weeks. And we actually refer to this also as walking pneumonia. And it's characterized by excessive sweating and an unproductive yet persistent cough. And so when you think of unproductive cough, so um, that's when you have like that really dry cough, like, <coughs> right? Cause it's, it's not productive in the sense that you're not like coughing anything up, you're not clearing anything. So it's kind of that dry cough that uh, won't go away. And then um, you, it's a little easier to diagnose because it looks like a fried egg because it doesn't have um, the cell wall, it doesn't have that kind of like tight shape that most cells do. And so um, this one is uh, more of a fried egg appearance um, when viewed under the microscope. All right, last disease for this section, and that is going to be nosocomial pneumonia. Remember, nosocomial means in like hospital-like settings, healthcare associated settings. And so the causative agent of nosocomial pneumonia is going to be Klebsiella pneumoniae. And um, it's, we've talked about this organism, I, I think we've talked about it, no, maybe not. Um, it's associated more with um, infections as a result of like surgical um, infections or like deeper wounds. Um, it can cause meningitis, it's not one of the um, leading causative agents, which is why we didn't talk about it earlier. 
um, is mainly associated with pneumonia in hospital-like settings. And so if you look at this picture, it actually has quite a few virulence factors. Um, so it's going to have um, the capsule and LPS because it's a gram negative organism, various types of adhesins, which are going to help the bacteria adhere um, to cells. And it also has a siderophore, which is a molecule that sequesters iron from the host. And as you know, iron is pretty important for our well being. So um, this can be spread pretty easily from person to person. And so in a hospital, right, where people are already immunocompromised, um, it's very easy for them to get pneumonia as a secondary infection. And um, it can be diagnosed um, by the presence of a cough with um, yellow green mucus. Sometimes there's even bloody spew uh, sputum and some breathing issues, which that part's probably not surprising because it is pneumonia, but also recurrent chills. Okay, so kind of collectively, um, it's easier to diagnose um, in the hospital setting. But as you notice on the bottom of this slide, what's um, more alarming is that there really isn't any treatment. There's no vaccine against this bacteria. And so when it occurs in um, hospital settings, normally as like a secondary infection, there's really just supportive care. Um, and it can, can be very dangerous um, to, to people depending on what that primary infection um, was or was caused by. All right, y'all, that is the end of our respiratory diseases. Let me know if you have any